Recording has started. We ready to get started then, Michael? Yes, sir. So <clears throat> this is Dr. Richardson, Dr. McMasters is, is on vacation, even though he's on the call. Uh, and uh, he asked me just to introduce Dr. Eggers, which I'm sure most people know. But uh, for students or anybody who, who doesn't know a little about Michael's background, Michael is uh, uh, actually graduated from the University of the South in Swanee, I believe, for his undergraduate. I think, isn't that right, Michael? And then yes, went to Emory Medical School, did his general surgery residency here, did some special time in, in the lab uh, while he was here, and then completed a, a surgical oncology fellowship at MD Anderson, and then was persuaded to rejoin our faculty. Michael now serves uh, not only on, on in the oncology faculty, but is also uh, the surgical quality officer for University Hospital, which is a new job. He's really done very well. Uh, I say this, I'll make the next statement with no sense of personal pride because it had nothing to do with it, but Michael's the kind of person that really made you proud to be an academic surgeon because he's really done a wonderful job and watching his growth and development has been just amazing, and, and we're just so glad he's with our faculty. He's going to talk to us today about various enhanced recovery protocols, which are in place for virtually everything now in terms of length of stay, getting people out of the hospital, and hopefully keeping them out of the hospital. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Michael, and, and thank you very much uh, for doing this this morning. Yes, sir, my pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was going to talk about adrenal nodules because uh, it's coming up close to the um, ab site, but Dr. Quiddle gave uh, a better lecture than I could a couple months ago. So uh, we switched gears a little bit, and today we're going to talk about enhanced recovery programs for surgery. Uh, no relevant disclosures. And the idea today is to talk briefly about the sort of evolution or history of enhanced recovery programs, break it down to its key components. Um, across all the phases of operative care. Discuss some barriers um, to implementation, some struggles that uh, maybe we've had as an institution or others have reported and how to implement these kinds of programs. And then I wanna touch briefly on some of the efforts that we're doing uh, both the University Hospital and with the University of Louisville Department of Surgery, particularly with the Division of Surgical Oncology. Our stated objectives are to identify the key components of an enhanced recovery program. As we just discussed, discussed uh, describe some of the barriers to implementation, some of the positive outcomes. First, a little bit about history, but first, um, a word about words, if you will. So the title is Enhanced Recovery, and most people know it as ERAS, and ERAS stands for Enhanced Recovery After Surgery. Now, interestingly, ERAS is a trademark term owned by the ERAS Society. Um, and so while it's become commonplace to, to refer to these programs in general as ERAS programs, uh, you're kind of technically not supposed to do that. And so throughout this talk, I will try to use enhanced recovery uh, when I discuss these uh, programs. ERAS has become so commonplace though, right? It's like Kleenex or Q-tip or Band-Aid or something like that, where the brand name is really sort of known as, as the generic program in and of itself. So what is enhanced recovery? And this is from the ERAS Society. And really it's a multimodal perioperative care pathway. And it's designed to achieve early recovery for patients undergoing major surgery. And I think that component of early recovery is important. And we'll talk about the evolution of what it sort of used to be known as and why they tried to develop this, this term of enhanced recovery. And what it really is, is um, multidisciplinary, multimodal, and it thinks about the return of abnormal physiology, right? The return to homeostasis, basically. The idea is to limit the perturbations in the hit to physiology that a major surgery gives you. And that process starts early. That process starts outside of the hospital. In, a pre in the pre-admission counseling in the surgeon's office. It carries out through the operative phase. The intraoperative phase is a critical part of an enhanced recovery program, but probably the most visible phase then is the post-operative phase. And we'll sort of break down all of those areas, um, discuss some of the components of each. Again, the end result or the goal really is maintenance of homeostasis with the end result being enhanced recovery. 
So I think it's important to, just to take a step back and reflect on how incredibly traumatic the eye surgery is, how, how incredibly disruptive it is to the body's normal homeostasis. You know, and, and that disruption starts two days before the operation. Their last solid meal usually is two days before an operation. The day before a major colorectal operation, they're on a bowel prep. So they're drinking clear liquid diets only. They're taking a bowel prep that disrupts their sleep. And then we get them up at an hour that we're used to, but the patients are not. They drive halfway across the state sometimes. And they come to the hospital, bright lights, people they've never met. They're whisked off to the operating room. The operating room, the real trauma begins. We, we have a medieval rack called the Thompson device where we stretch open their abdomen to limits not normally appreciative by the normal physiology or anatomy of the body. We manipulate the bowels, we tear and cut things, we sew things back together, we bash them together with staplers, all the time giving them supraphysiologic levels of fluid, giving them opioids to which they may have never been exposed. So you can imagine the tremendous inflammatory response that comes from this. There's certainly an activation of mast cells, monocytes, monocytes and macrophages that then release all the evil humors of the body, including TNF alpha, histamines, prostanoids, and interleukins. And then just think about the sort of sympathetic stimulation. They are under a stress response. They're under an incredible stress response. Maybe with, with sympathetic stimulation at the bottom right there, but it's that often leads to post operative uh, or events that can derail and enhance your recovery system. It's been an incredibly stressful experience, not only mentally, but physically. Right? And um, it was recognition of this that really started the enhanced recovery process. And this is Henri K. Kalit, um, um, who's a co Rectal surgeon, he has a PhD, and so he is um, sort of like the glucocorticoid hypothalamic stress response in humans, right? So this is a smart guy who knows a lot about the physiologic stress response in humans. And so he was sort of understood this, and he understood that to control the postoperative physiology disruptions that happen with major abdominal surgery, it starts with preoperative information and teaching. It's attenuation of these stresses, adequate pain relief. He focused on exercise a lot, preoperatively and then in the immediate postoperative. Good natural enteral nutrition, stimulation of growth factors. And if you can do all these things, you can reduce complications and accelerate convalescence or recovery. So he started writing about this in the, in the late 90s. Um, this is a paper in 1999. Him and another co-author publishing a, a, a paper on 16 patients um, from their uh, hospital in Denmark. I will not try to pronounce that name. Um, but these are open elective sigmoid resections, all of whom had an epidural catheter. No nasogastric tube or drain was placed. They describe a periop or preoperative education. They were mobilized the day of surgery, as he called enforced mobilization, which sounds like a forced march. And they simply reported at the time what were simply remarkable results in that the median length of stay in this cohort was two days at a time when most open sigmoid colon resections would stay seven to 10 days in the hospital. And in this small group, um, they reported no readmissions or complications. Um, the graph on the bottom left is interesting. This is this mean time out of bed during the day. So on post-op day two, they were spending an average of four hours out of bed each day. And then so when they were home, then typically after the post-op day two, they were spending up to upwards of 12 hours a day out of bed. Um, and this would be this would be simply remarkable in some of our patients right now. You can see that his his um, emphasis on mobilization. The bottom right is self-reported pain, um, symptom like nausea levels, and you can see we've come a long way from a self-described slight pain to the pain scales uh, metrics that we have today. But basically he showed that you could do this, you could do this safely in a small group of patients, they would go home. And so 
the, in Europe then, so this was in Denmark, and so some of his colleagues got interested in this, and then this is the development of the ERAS Society, which I mentioned earlier. And so they first formed an ERAS study group. This was four additional centers in Norway, uh, Scotland, Scotland, the Netherlands, and in Sweden. And they, they've all kind of got together and they started, kind of sounds like, like any meeting, it sort of started as a social thing, trading ideas. Um, but really to uh, figure out how they can implement these programs in their own. And so years later, they describe a larger series, what they would call accelerated recovery. And this is 60 patients undergoing elective colon resections with a planned two-day hospital course. Um, now, another another innovation or another change that they were making to this is these patients did not get a bowel prep. So on the right are um, is, is the is the graph of the number of patients um, and when they were discharged. And group C is the um, the darker group is the kind of the regular group. Group A are patients in whom they said preoperative, they are like, there's no way these patients will stay two days. We're going to kind of like call it ahead of time that they're not going to stay two days, but we'll see how they do. Group B, the uh, white bar, are the patients that interoperatively they decided they weren't going to stay. Maybe it was more complicated than a ureter injury. Anyways, they kind of called it again that they may not be able to make it. But you can see, so in the 60 patient group, in 32 of them, over 50%, um, they met their planned two-day hospital course, including two, three patients who they had said from the beginning, a priori, they were never even going to try to get them out in two days. And you can see here, if you had 52, oh, 56 times went home in four days. And uh, so as we think about, you know, patients always ask me after GM, malfunction and their Pain's controlled with a pill. Sort of the pain's pretty well controlled with an epidural. Now they have to transition off an epidural. You can see here a chart of bowel function returning. And so in over half of patients, bowel function returned with So this, this initially was called fast track surgery. Um, and they realized that that um, was not the correct emphasis because it made it sound like the emphasis was on discharge, right? So the the outcome, the goal of an enhanced recovery program is not to decrease length of stay. An enhanced recovery program, the goal is to return the patient to normal homeostasis and to normal physiology after surgery. And end result of that is that they're ready to go home earlier and they, there is a decreased length of stay. Um, but that's not the focus. So in, rather than sort of focus and call it fast track surgery, the terminology of enhanced recovery development. And it's quite simply taken off. And so a lot of the data, there are some data, um, and so we'll talk about some of that data. And most of that data is going to be rooted in colon and rectal surgery. That's where uh, enhanced recovery was born. That's where it was matured. And that's where it's simply, quite frankly, been perfected. But it just is everywhere now, right? So uh, gynecology has embraced it. Hepatobiliary surgery has embraced it. The urologists have embraced it. There are fast track or there are enhanced recovery programs for orthopedic, for spine and uh, hip replacements. Upper GI foregut surgery is using it now. Neurosurgery is using it now. Cardiothoracic surgery has enhanced recovery. It essentially has touched all aspects of, of surgery and mostly elective surgery. And that's mostly what we're talking about here is elective surgery. But essentially in all surgical disciplines, there, there is a role, I believe, for enhanced recovery. So what are the key components of an enhanced recovery program? <clears throat> This is a slide I borrowed from uh, Tom Aloya, who was one of my faculty members at MD Anderson. And he describes sort of the four pillars of an enhanced recovery program, which involve early feeding, goal-directed fluid therapy, non-narcotic or opioid-sparing analgesia, and uh, aggressive early ambulation. Uh, now, of course, the foundation of this, if we torture the, the metaphor a little bit here, um, is patient education and engagement which underlies all of this and starts in the preoperative area. And this is the foundation upon which an enhanced recovery program is built. It's important to understand that enhanced recovery starts the outside of the hospital. Enhanced recovery starts in the clinic. Um, and so we'll look at both the preoperative, intraoperative phases, and finally the postoperative phase. And again, postoperative phase, I think is where we both, where we all recognize sort of the, the most dramatic changes to how we do things.
But I, I think it's key for a successful enhanced recovery program is to understand the important components in all of these phases of care, preoperatively patient counseling, uh, then pre-medication right uh, just prior to going back to the operating room is important. Intraoperatively, the anesthesia team has a critical role to play with regards to fluid, manage, uh, fluid balance and pain management. The operative approach, of course, is important from a surgeon's standpoint. Then all the elements in the post-operative care plan. Look at preoperatively, enhanced recovery starts in the office. And it describes, you know, you need to describe the enhanced recovery program, describe the ERAS program to the patients. And, you know, really, I, they, it's, it's exciting to be part of a program, right? Like you tell the patients, you're, we're going to do this. We're doing an ERAS program, an enhanced recovery program. You're going to recover from surgery faster. They're all on board. They're, they're, that sounds great, right? Um, smoking cessation is critically important. Um, and um, that's a cessation, counseling, things like that. That's going to be important to any surgery program, really, besides enhanced recovery. Understanding and discussing their pain control plan, I think, is critical. This has changed just in the 12 and a half years that I've been out of medical school, is the patient's perception, understanding, and quite frankly, fear of opioid dependence after surgery. We looked at our surgical oncology patients, about a third of our patients um, come to surgery on um, preoperative narcotics. Um, interestingly, of those, about 60% of them are still on narcotics three months after surgery. Um, but now, I mean, I hear patients telling me, you know, right after, I don't want heavy pain medicine, I don't want narcotics, I don't want to get hooked. Um, and that just never happened 10 years, even 10 years ago. I don't think that happened. Most people were concerned about their pain control and was asking how we were going to control it. This is a much different conversation for somebody on chronic pain medicine rather than for somebody who is opioid naive and, of course, depends on your plan of the operation. And bowel prep only if needed. So, so enhanced recovery, you know, was, they started the sort of no bowel prep thing. Um, what's old is new again, and we've sort of come full circle. And from, a, from an SSI standpoint, I think most of us favor a bowel prep for elective colon and certainly rectal resections. The enhanced recovery guidelines, the ERAS guidelines still say they kind of say, okay, maybe you can do a bowel prep for rectal resections, but they still sort of recommend no bowel prep uh, in general. Um, so that's a, a point that one may disagree on. Uh, but certainly non-colorectal operations do not need a bowel prep. I think nutrition management is critical. Um, and a lot of enhanced recovery programs will describe some sort of protein supplementation. Most have a carbohydrate load which is not as dramatic as it sounds. It's basically like drinking apple juice or Gatorade three hours before surgery. So um, the days of NPO after midnight are gone. And we've moved at the University of Louisville, our standing preoperative order, order instructions for every patient um, are that they can have clear liquids up to two hours before surgery. So basically before they leave the house, right? Um, but we ask them to drink a Gatorade or some apple juice or something like that three hours before surgery. And that limits the hypoglycemia associated with being uh, nothing by mouth. I have a cheeseburger there. Cheeseburger is probably not the most best thing to eat right before surgery. But again, good protein supplementation, boost or insure, something like that we found. And this goes to prehabilitation. This is a concept in which uh, Dr. Martin uh, and I are particularly interested in. So the concept of the preoperative area, uh, the preoperative time being when actually improved surgery. This doesn't always work um, for semi-urgent sort of things um, that need to get taken care of, but for cancer operations, a lot of time they're going to get neoadjuvant therapy or preoperative therapy, be that either chemotherapy or radiation. We have a period of time, sometimes several months, that a patient is not going to surgery, but we know they're going to get there. Except a prehabilitation, right? A rehab program prior to surgery, but not exercise program, improve fitness for surgery. I think is very appealing to have this window. <clears throat> we know they're going to take a physio to get from surgery, right? The curve is going to drop. What we want to do with prehab is shift curves so that that rock in physiology, that physiologic hit doesn't go like right? We, we sort of give them a reserve such that they can sustain that. And this is like this curve is sort of, um, you know, uh, a hypothetical curve, right? But it's actually borne out exactly in data right here. So this is a group um, that looked at a preoperative um, uh, 
just for colon resection, uh, rectal resections that are going uh, pre uh, neoadjuvant chemo radiation. They randomize people to rehabilitation after surgery versus a prehabilitation. And this is the this is their six minute walk test. So this is kind of a standard fitness test. You can see everybody started off the same, but before surgery, the prehab group had improved six minute walk test. And you can see the other group sort of declined a little bit. And while both groups did took a hit afterwards, right from surgery, four weeks post op, they had decreased uh, decreased their fitness. They both bounced back, but you can see that the prehab group stayed above the non-prehab group throughout the entire course. So this is a very appealing thing, and this is part of an enhanced recovery. The preoperative analgesia, so in the in the pre-op area, um, you know, in on the stretcher before they go back to the operation, um, most enhanced recovery programs will give them uh, some load of pain medicine, which includes acetaminophen, an inset of choice, and a gabapentinoid, which we are usually using gabapentin or neurotin. Another example would be Lyrica that you could use. Uh, but this is an idea of to start the pain control early with an oral regimen that'll sort of stay in the system. So intraoperatively now, in the intraoperative phase, uh, the enhanced recovery movement or an enhanced recovery program, um, it's critical to understand um, the importance of fluid balance. So gone are the days of like a liter of hour to accomplish, you know, to compensate for insensible losses and things like that. We're shooting for zero fluid balance. And so in some programs that may be a basal fluid rate um, as low as three cc's per kilo per hour. It may be no basal rate and only sort of what we would call goal directed replacement of IV fluids. Um, and the emphasis on balance isotonic crystalloid rather than normal saline. And then again, guiding your resuscitation, um, sort of a goal-directed manner, utilizing stroke volume variation to estimate the patient's intravascular volume, see when they might need volume, again, as a replacement. Dr. Bozeman gave a great talk a couple weeks ago about the dangers of um, over-resuscitation. I think that um, those lessons are, are apply very well to the enhanced recovery program. And again, we're shooting for normovolemia, right? We're not trying to make a patient hypovolemia. Hypovolemic patient, you have an increased risk of end organ perfusion, a systemic inflammatory response, sepsis, and organ failure. That is not what we're looking for. We're shooting for that sweet spot of normovolemia because what we also don't want is hypervolemia. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which over resuscitation of fluid volume would increase your risk of pulmonary edema, ileus, post operative nausea, vomiting, and other cardiopulmonary complications. So, again, again, this concept of homeostasis, of maintaining normal physiology, not overshooting it, not undershooting it. That's the goal of an enhancement. There are some data to suggest that this is important. So, um, this is a randomized clinical trial of a um, restrictive perioperative fluid regimen versus a sort of a standard regimen. And most of these, notice, this says perioperative. So this is not just in the intraoperative phase, but it's postoperative as well. But here in this study, um, the restricted regimen, they got an epidural catheter, but there was no preloading. There was no bolus of fluid for the epidural in the restricted group versus the standard group who got a bolus of fluid. There was no standard third loss fluid replacement as opposed to the usual seven cc's per kilo per hour in the standard group. And um, basically, they tried to replace um, any sort of losses with a little bit of uh, glucose-containing uh, <clears throat> crystalloid rather than uh, normal saline. <clears throat> you can see here that um, the increased rate of complications in the fluid restricted group, the rate of complications was 30% in the instrument. And it was it went in lockstep with the amount of volume. So, um, the first bar graph there in the middle on the darker bars are the influence. So three and a half to five and a half liters to greater than five liters. You can see here a dose response to complication frequency as the amount of volume they received increased. Then this is body weight increase on the right. Again, um, <clears throat> if you could keep them to less than half a kilogram, so that's like a pound, right? That's kind of hard to do. Uh, but you can see if you started gaining more than five pounds of water weight, the increase, the complication frequency increased. Um, this is another uh, study as well. 
um, this is in an existing enhanced recovery program. So here's a group that had an existing, uh, this is Dr. Kalitz group again, had an existing quote fast track at this time is what they were still calling it. And they looked at a liberal versus restrictive fluid regimen. And they didn't show an they didn't show a change in complications. So they didn't show an increased risk of complications. They didn't show a decrease. They showed sort of equivalent complications, but they did show improved postoperative pulmonary function and hypoxia with the restricted fluid group. So here are uh, pulmonary function tests, forced vital capacity, and forced expiratory volume, uh, both improved with the low fluid group. <clears throat> we talked about goal directed. Now we're going to move to the postoperative phase. And so the, our pillars of enhanced recovery apply to the postoperative phase. Let's switch gears a little bit. We'll return back to goal-directed fluid therapy. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about non-narcotic analgesia or analgesia in general. I think, you know, a postoperative pain control plan, you know, is sort of a pyramid structure here, right? The foundation of which is some sort of regional or block anesthesia, if possible, not necessarily for everybody followed by some scheduled medications and then PRN medications as needed. Focusing first on regional or block therapies. These may, um, these can exist in several flavors and a lot of times these are sort of institutional specific. But most typically this would be an epidural catheter um, or a, what I'll call, what we would call a TAP block, which TAP stands for transversus abdominis pain block or wound infusion catheters. Um, we were using those a lot when I was a resident for rib fractures. And I don't know if we use those much anymore. But mainly the, the, the big kind of question for most people is the question of whether you'd use an epidural catheter <clears throat> or whether you do an, an, uh, an anesthesia, usually anesthesia directed tap block. So we have some data and, 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 and it's not great, but um, here's a randomized trial. So colonorectal surgery in an existing enhanced recovery program, they basically randomized patients to uh, an epidural catheter or a TAP block. And importantly, this paper uses liposomal pupivacaine, um, often the trade name of which is Expiril. And this is usually a big point of contention for TAP blocks um, because TAP blocks, when they're just given with normal pupivacaine, essentially marking, you know, they wear off in, in half a day. Um, liposomal bupivacaine uh, essentially sits around for 72 to 96 hours, and so it provides more long-lasting pain. So this study, uh, elective colorectal operation, single center, they could be either open or minimally invasive. Basically, half of them are randomized to a TAP block and half randomized to an epidural. These are their pain scores. Um, and so look at the solid lines. So the blue is, are the tap blocks and the red are the epidurals. And you can see on the, and early on in that first post-operative day, the pain scores were lower for the epidural. So lower is better, right? So on an analog scale of zero to 10, right? Um, however, you can see they quickly converge and um, basically they're the same from post-op day one thereafter. Now, interestingly, on the right, you see their uh, total morphine equivalents, and this was actually higher for the epidural group versus the TAP group. Um, and this is interesting, and this is not um, what we'll see in a couple other studies that we'll look at. But you can see, again, day zero, day one, you see those differences, but by day two or day three, um, they're essentially the same. This group looked at it from a cost standpoint as well, and the epidural group um, was higher. So, so remember, this was a, a group that had Expiril, and so the, the, the big um, tap block is that liposomal bupivacaine is expensive. It can be a couple hundred dollars. Um, however, the epidural group was more expensive, and the reason for that is that there are, in, there are professional fees. You have an anesthesia team rounding on the patient every day. Um, and so that greatly increases the cost associated with an epidural. <clears throat> so here is a laparoscopic colorectal uh, surgery paper, which randomized elective laparoscopic colorectal patients within an existing enhanced recovery program to either an epidural, a spinal block, or a PCA. So they didn't use a regional block here. This is just a straight patient-controlled analgesia. <clears throat> and here they show that an epidural was associated with a longer length of stay and that the more IV fluid was required in the epidural group. 
And so there's an, there are, so there are two components, there are two sort of drawbacks there to an epidural group is perhaps it, it, decre it increases the length of stay. And, and there are episodes of hypotension that are often treated with fluid boluses, right? And again, enhanced recovery is all about limiting IV fluids, unnecessary IV fluids. Uh, one paper I saw suggested that for every excess liter of fluid a patient gets, that increases their length of stay by a day. Um, and so that's a potential drawback to an epidural versus the spinal analgesia, uh, the, the spinal or the PCA. <clears throat> now this has been looked at um, in HPB surgery. This is a study that was, that was ongoing when I was a fellow. <clears throat> they call it a pedal biliary. It's basically it was basically all liver resections, but um, they randomized elective liver resections uh, to either a thoracic epidural or a PCA. I don't know why they did it in a two and a half to one fashion, but that's how they ended up with 100 epidurals versus 34 PCAs for open liver resections. And we see a similar pattern that we saw with that first paper in that uh, the ep the uh, PCA group had higher pain scores, which is worse pain control than the epidural. So the epidural had better pain control that first day, but they converged pretty quickly. And after post-operative day one, pain control was similar between the two. <clears throat> um, and then in this group, which is actually what most groups will show, is that a patient's treated with the PCA, they will have higher morphine equivalents with an epidural. And so the the main outcomes were the morphine equivalents, and they certainly showed that the um, had fewer morphine equivalents than the PCA group. Um, however, they had equivalent length of stay. So this group showed that general did not let stay. And, uh, um, you know, I think it matters how you're doing it. Great limiting. Is going to be an epidural after that, like where you have a hit on your leg. The rate limiting step is physiologic recovery, kind of thing like that. That was probably down. We did a subgroup analysis of this um, uh, of this group and showed that uh, patients in the enhanced recovery program um, with an epidural it was actually it was like more cost effective, um, and so that was sort of. A cost. There was not a lot of cost data in that paper, but there are suggestions that the enhanced recovery programs are cost effective. All right. So, what do we choose? So, when do we choose an epidural, <clears throat> and when do we sort of choose a, a tap block or some sort of regional block? Right. Well, I think it depends. Right. So, you think about an epidural. I think you probably get better pain control, um, certainly for like lower abdominal operations or for GI operations. And you, uh, most of most papers will suggest that you use less narcotics, and our own data suggests that as well from the Surgical Oncology Division. However, there's probably an increased cost. There's increased complexity, right? There's another cook in the kitchen. There's another team. And if that team is not fully on board your sort of enhanced recovery program, that could sort of gum up the works a little bit. And again, for operations where there may be a two or three day length of stay target, an epidural might slow that down. Now, again, a major pedobiliary section where they're going to stay six or seven days, an epidural might not matter. Tap blocks, I think, are less complex. They're quicker. Um, you know, usually they're done after the operation here, which never made sense to me. I will, you know, I think if you're using liposomal bupivacaine especially, you should give it before the operation. But uh, here we typically give it after the operation. Probably fewer complications, right? There's no, there's no spinal hematoma or anything like that. Maybe a decreased length of stay. However, they probably don't work as well as an epidural, especially if you don't have long-acting liposomal bupivacaine, and they may develop more narcotics. So, you know, I, I like to think of, you know, the post-operative pain control plan, which one do we choose? It's goal-directed, it's patient-directed, so just like we, de you know, we develop sort of an individualized pain plan. So, um, you know, Dr. Ikai was used to use epidurals a lot for his uh, mastectomies, and now he's gone to these, um, not even, they're not even paravertebral blocks, they call them something different, but a regional block, and they work exceptionally well. And so, you know, for, for a patient like that, where you have a good regional block option, where they're gonna stay a day, I think a block makes sense, right? I think patient expectations are critically important to understand. Um, you know, are they, um, pre, their previous narcotic use, are they opioid naive? I think if they're opioid naive, I think you have a lot better shot at getting through with non-narcotic analgesia and a regional block. I think if they're on a lot of long-acting narcotics, 
I think a lot of times those patients are better served with an epidural. Certainly the operative approach. I don't know that a laparoscopic uh, operation benefits much from an epidural. I think you can get pretty good control with a regional block there. So I use both, right? You know, which ones do I use? I We, we sort of reserve the uh, ability to use either one of these and depending on the operation and the patient. So then we're talking, we're still in post-operative pain control and we'll go to the scheduled pain medicine. I think scheduled pain medicine is a critical component of post-operative pain control. And that will typically be some sort of scheduled NSAID um, of choice. Uh, we typically are using Celebrex, um, but that can be that could be ibuprofen if you wanted. Um, again, some sort of gabapentinoid. Again, we are usually using Neurontin or gabapentin. Um, other uh, programs I've seen use Lyrica. You have to be careful with Lyrica in elderly patients. It can precipitate some confusion. Um, and then Tylenol. I think scheduled Tylenol is a critical component as well. Not going to get into the IV versus oral Tylenol debate. Um, that's a cost sort of administrative kind of issue a lot of times. Um, but there are very few patients that can't take oral Tylenol. Comes in as elixir, you know, I would argue. And I would schedule that. I think you have to watch your Tylenol, um, total Tylenol count, right? Especially um, for patients who are getting um, some sort of uh, hydrocodone, you know, Norco or something like that. But I think um, basically everybody can get you know, for up to four grams of Tylenol a day. Uh, liver resections can get Tylenol. So a major liver resection, we would limit them to two grams of Tylenol a day, but a minor hepatectomy can get the full four grams of Tylenol a day. And then PRN, you still need a breakthrough, right? Because it's when you lose control of pain is when you really get in trouble, I think, and when you really sort of get off the non-narcotic plan. Um, and so your PRNs could be narcotics, they could be non-narcotics, they could be IV or oral, and I still think a PCA has a role, but what I often, I'll tell the residents is, you know, sometimes just like give give them a PCA of, you know, 0 0.1 of the lauded like every 20 minutes or something, right? Really anything, you can keep it total down, it gives them a little bit of control, it gives them a little bit We're, you know, focus on early ambulation. We want adequate pain control so they can get up and move around. Going back to where we've discussed non period. This is again a conceptual model. Um, and what we're going to just very smart of the patient's entire hospitalization, right? And you can still get into a lot of volume trouble, volume issues um, and fluid shifts in the post-operative phase. And again, ERAS is all about minimizing that physiologic disruption, right? We want to stay in this sweet spot of normal volemia. ERAS is not about making patients dry, okay? Enhanced recovery does not look to make a patient hypovolemic because we don't want splanchnic hypoperfusion, we don't want vital end organ perfusion. Because we get behind, we give too much fluid, then there's fluid shifts and we get into pulmonary edema, right? And it's just this vicious, vicious cycle. So we wanna even out those, um, those highs and lows of fluid management. And basically the way you do that is careful monitoring of fluid intraoperatively and cessation of IV fluid as soon as you can. So what do we target? So a typical goal for an enhanced recovery program will be less than 30 cc's per kilogram of net IV fluid intake. Um, you're shooting for less than two gram, two kilograms of total weight gain, so um, about four pounds, four to five. You know, you want to, you don't want to gain more than five pounds of water weight. This is where daily weights, I think, are helpful. You know, we we use that on the cardiac service all the time when I was a resident, but that was sort of really the only the only place we were using it. Um, but I think it's important. And another benefit of that is, you know, put the scale on the other side of the room, and that's another time for the patient to get up and walk, right? Don't use the bed scale. I think we need to be very quick to stop IV fluids when they're taking adequate oral intake. I think we need to set our IV fluid rates lower from the initial operation and be very quick to turn it off. You know, remember, patients, you know, and then when we're bowel prepping patients who are inpatient or something like that, right? Patients take bowel preps at home without IV fluids, right? But inevitably, when they're in the when when they're in the hospital, somebody's MPO for surgery, they get a hundred cc's an hour of fluid, and they've had a liter and a half of fluid by the time you round it on in the morning, um, and that's just we just can't do that. Um, I think urine output is an important parameter. It's not the only parameter, and really, I think you know, 
we've gotten away from sort of a weight based assessment of, of urine output. Um, and when we'll get, we'll freak out when these little old ladies are peeing 25 cc's an hour of fluid. Um, and we expect them to have the urine output of like the 300 pound guy right next to them in the next room. And that's just not the case. So I typically shoot for about 50 cc's an hour uh, every two hours. So allow them a little fluctuation. Um, but again, if their blood pressure is okay, their heart rate's okay, and their creatinine and BUN are stable, we'll accept a low urine output um, in that transient post-operative period. So what are some, you know, so we talked about some of the vitals, we talked about urine output. You know, some other proposed measures of monitoring volume status would be measuring, uh, monitoring their BNP, their brain natriuretic protein, right? So this is the, the heart failure um, lab, basically, right? And uh, I always have to clarify that. Everybody thinks I say BMP, like a basic metabolic panel. Um, so this is a paper in which they used a BNP guided volume status management um, after liver resection. And they showed a reduction in cardiopulmonary and renal complications. And basically this is just daily BNPs and you just trend it. You, um, a single BNP is probably not helpful, but you wanna trend it over time. You're typically shooting for this 100 to 200 range. Um, and that means they're basically euvolemic. Anything under 100, they're probably a little dry. Um, for like a liver resection, if they're doing well, I probably am okay with it being about 50 to 100 because that's probably kind of appropriately dry. But certainly anything under 50, you would consider volume resuscitating. Then anything over 200, you would consider giving them diuresis. And so in this paper, what they showed is when they switched in 2014 to this BNP guided fluid protocol, um, these are their uh, NISQIP data. They show the rate of cardiopulmonary complications decreased dramatically um, in the last three years in which they had this BNP fluid protocol. So the other post-operative measures, um, kind of just touch on them briefly. I think ambulation is critically important early and often. Um, the residents know, you know, I, I usually order ambulation walks and, and doses of six. So everybody walks six times a day and then 12 times a day, 18 times a day, et cetera. Um, they just need to be out, out, out of the bed, in the chair, if they're not in bed. Um, early oral intake, right? So I think kind of just like in cancer surgery, every time we, we check and see if we can do a smaller operation, a less radical operation, it's probably okay. I think in general, we found that if we feed people earlier, it's probably okay. Certainly colorectal surgery has embraced this. Um, but even for um, a foregone operation, that oral intake is likely. Again, it gets them back to that normal physiology. The of tubes and drains, um, again, full catheters um, need to come out basically as soon as possible. Um, you know, drains, we, don't, we no longer use drains for major liver resections. Um, there are some people who don't use them for pancreas resections. We try to get those drains out as quickly as possible. <clears throat> all these little things, again, just trying to get the patient back to the normal. And I think it's really what underpins all of this is patient education and preparation, right? So as soon as they're, you know, from the second they're on the recovery ward, we start thinking about going home. They start planning themselves. They need to learn how to deliver their own Lovenox. They need to learn how to strip their drains if they have drains. Um, you know, I often will refer to the day prior to discharge as the practice day tell the patients they have to do everything themselves that day. They have to take the shower. They have to give themselves the Lovenox. They have to do this, that, and the other. And it sort of empowers them that they're ready to go home. So when does this fail? When, what, what are the barriers? And um, <clears throat> I love the title of this paper because I, when I came across it, right, a protocol is not enough to implement an enhanced recovery program. Having an order set that says ERAS on it is not an enhanced recovery program. As I did some reflection, I'm kind of like, well, that's kind of what we have right now. So I don't think we're there yet. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that at University Hospital. But this looked at, um, you know, so here's a graph of the patients in an enhanced recovery program who recovered, and they define recovery as, you know, pain control, bowel function, ready to go home. And then the proportion of those patients who were willing to go home and then who were actually discharged. And so you see here, there's a persistent gap in those that meet the objective measurements of recovery and those that are discharged. And you see a lot of it is patients not willing to go home, right? They're ready, by all physiologic parameters, they're ready to go home, but they don't believe it. This is where that patient empowering and that patient education is critically. 
and then there's still a gap in those willing to go home and the doctor doesn't let them go home, right? Um, and so I think we all have to trust our endpoints. And then in this, this was a group, this was that original sort of ERAS group and it's so it was Dr. Kalich group in uh, Denmark kind of compared to everybody else. And they basically show that the predictors for on-time discharge, which would be over here on the right, um, our previous experience and no delay in discharge from like a logistics standpoint. The thing that really derails an ERAS program is any complication. And, it's, and essentially an enhanced recovery pathway kind of goes out the window if you have a real complication. If you have a post-operative ileus that needs an NG tube, you have a, uh, a SSI, that's when you really kind of get off the rails. And then other, these other predictors of an on-time discharge, again, it's all about ambulation, it's all about fluids, and it's about epidurals and catheters. These are data from our own institution. This is data from the Surge Onc um, that Dr. Martin has recently submitted. Um, and you can see here, as the percentage of ERAS compliance parameters goes up, length of stay goes down. There's an inverse relationship. So the more parameters, the more compliance we're hitting, the lower our length of stay. So why is, why is enhanced recovery so hard? Well, there's just so many people involved. There's so many moving parts, right? <clears throat> so we have the pre-admission phase, we have the pre-operative phase, the intraoperative phase, the post-operative phase. We have surgeons involved in all those areas. We have anesthesiologists involved in those areas. We have nursing involved in all those areas. We have house staff involved in all of those areas. All of these areas are critically important. You have to have everybody on the same page. So there was a, uh, Tom Aloya tells this story, and I, I guess I don't know how accurate it is, but I'll relay the story as he tells it. There was an academic uh, program that had an enhanced recovery program. They, they were meeting all their, <clears throat> they thought they were doing everything right, <clears throat> and they still weren't hitting their discharge goals. They were still having trouble. You know, their length of stay wasn't dropping. They couldn't figure out what was going on. Finally, they figured out that patients were getting bolused in the middle of the night uh, by the on-call house staff. And all they did was basically educate the house staff, and then ultimately they basically said nobody could get a bolus at night without an attending approval. And that was the last component. And once that component hit, length of stay dropped, their recovery and you know uh, took off, and they were off to the races. So there's all these tiny little parts that you might not think about, you might not realize until you get going. You think about implementation, right? So developing an enhanced recovery program is really sort of an implementation science kind of issue. And there's really three phases of that. And when we talk about development, you talk about the enhanced recovery team. So who are we gonna who are we gonna put on this team, right? It has to be multidisciplinary. You have to have champions. You have to have surgeon champions, you have to have anesthesia champions, you have to have nursing champions, you have to have resident champions. You have to have people who address the whispering and grumbling in the surgeon's lounge about this, that, or the other, and what we're doing and the changes that we're making. You gotta have those out front vocal advocates to help you out, right? You need engagement from leadership. You need commitment of resources um, to do so. Um, and you really need your frontline staff, right? So this is this is where nursing comes in. This is where residents come in. And this is, you know, I, I've really tried to do this in some of the work that we've done on quality issues at University Hospital. Um, <clears throat> you look around these meetings and there's never a resident there. We all talk about how we can improve orders this and orders that and how we need to improve patient experience. The people who do 99% of the work in the hospital aren't at the table. And so this, you know, any enhanced recovery program is critical on getting a resident buy-in, the house staff buy-in. <clears throat> when it comes to implementation, again, you need to engage across all phases of care. <clears throat> Anesthesia sort of honestly needs to take ownership a lot of times um, in the pre-operative, the pre-medication and the intraoperative involvement. Again, nursing and house house staff involvement is just critical, absolutely necessary. And then maintenance, all right, so you've implemented a program, right? You pat yourself on the back, you get to go to your strategic plan meeting and you say, yes, we met our goals, we have an enhanced recovery program. Well, how do you keep it going? How do you, you know, are you really doing what you said you were gonna do? Are you, are you getting the end results? So you need audit tools, you need nurses, you, know, you need staff coming around, checking on patients, seeing if they're getting their medication, see if their fluids are being stopped. And you need to feed that data back, right? So nursing unit specific data, hey, five to stop, you're doing great on walking, you're doing good on getting the catheters out, we'll, we'll do to help. 
really this is where IT is There's a lot of data to collect. The more data you, you can collect in an automated fashion through your asset, the cheaper it is to monitor this and the more effective feedback you can. Again, this is uh, more information from the, the enhanced recovery study group that you were asked society. A huge response relationship between adherence and planned outcomes. So the light bar graph here is their first enhanced recovery. The darker graph is their sort of second. Recovery. And so they show decreased in morbidity and improvement in length of stay over time. I think that's important. This this isn't a light bulb that gets switched on. And it takes time to inculcate these beliefs. It takes time to develop this as second nature. Um, and so we need to stick with it. This is looking at adherence. Um, and so if you look at um, symptoms are basically self-reported nausea, vomiting, and pain control. The middle bar, 30-day uh, morbidity, and the last bar is 30 is uh, readmissions. And you can see as your compliance or adherence increases, um, your your outcomes improve. So you you know you can't get you can't get satisfied that you're meeting some of the components but not all of them. You really need to improve. Try to strive for meeting all of your requirements. So a little bit about our enhanced recovery program at the University of Louisville. Again, we're embracing the concept of, of having uh, components in place in the preoperative phase, the intraoperative phase, and the postoperative phase. Preoperatively for patient counseling, we have um, brochures uh, that we have available in the ULP offices, and we have these right now with sort of the, the old USA group, uh, our department's surgeons basically, right? Uh, but we're getting these out to gynecology. Um, and we're trying to get these out to some of the other surgical specialties as well. Again, it makes, you know, the patients are part of something. This is the program that we're using for you. And I think that that is um, critically important to get buy-in from the patient, describes the process, describes how we're gonna manage them, tries to answer their questions. And then we have standing preoperative order sets um, that um, is called the ERAS order set, and it is basically loads the patient with Tylenol, Celebrex, Gabapentin, and Tramadol, which is a narcotic, but we can use that as well. And it has a has a order standing order for limiting IV fluids, basically just having a KVO IV fluids in the preoperative area. What we're trying to avoid um, is the situation where a patient gets back to the operating room and has a liter and a half of fluid already on board from a prolonged preoperative stay. Interoperatively, um, certainly trying to embrace the concept of goal-directed fluid management, uh, liberal use of both epidurals and taps. And again, for me, that's a that's a patient-specific um, kind of which one we use. Again, I use both of them depending on the situation. And I think here, uh, an SSI bundle. I think SSI reduction is is an important part of an enhanced recovery program, and vice versa. So we talked about any sort of complications derail an enhanced recovery pathway. And so whatever we can do to reduce SSIs will improve our enhanced recovery process. And finally, postoperatively, um, the postoperative order sets that we have are minimizing tubes and drains, uh, nursing directed Foley removal, diet advancement, and standing multimodality analgesia. And we're doing auditing as well, and I'll show you that data here in a second. And what we're trying to do, so rather than develop an enhanced recovery order set for every service, what I've try to do kind of as a strategic decision is really just to make ERAS the default and actually try to just incorporate these multimodality pain management issue, uh, uh, methods um, and some of the diets advancements just into everybody's order sets. That just make that not the enhanced recovery order set, that's just the order set. Um, and to try to sort of, you know, put this into the DNA of the institution. So we have uh, enhanced recovery for the colorectal and surgical oncology elective surgery services. And this is the kind of audit feedback that we get back. So the gray bar is sort of our early uh, 2020 experience. And then June um, are the most recent data I had available for this talk at least. And you can see here we track, you know, we're pretty good on clear liquids, uh, diet advancement, we're less clear, less, less um, successful at. Uh, we still see here only about a third to 40% of our patients are having their fluids stopped on post-op day one. And again, it may not be appropriate for everybody, um, but these are the kind of metrics that we're able to chart. We also see this, this relationship where the more components that we hit, so if we hit six or seven, the ERAS components, our length of stay is lower than if we don't, 
if we only hit uh, one of those components. And of course, it's a chicken and the egg thing, right? I don't, you know, are you hitting all the components because the patient's doing well, or is the patient doing well because you're hitting all the components? I, I understand that there's this analysis isn't perfect, um, but we're trying to understand, you know, how we're doing and how we can improve. These are data from our own surgical oncology division in which we defined what we felt were the sort of evidence-based most important components. And here's our preoperative components that we think are critical. We're doing a pretty good job of smoking cessation and uh, ERAS education. We're doing less job, uh, less good of a job, less uh, well of a job of nutrition optimization. Uh, we're not doing a very good job of giving patients the oral pain medicines preoperatively. Only about a quarter of our patients are getting it. And so this gives us targets to improve upon. Again, data from surgical oncology, um, you know, we're having issues with hypothermia, um, opioids via epidural or equivalent non-opioids. We're still behind on that. I think we're struggling with goal-directed fluid therapy. Now, they, this is from uh, all of the hospitals, not just University Hospital for the surgical oncology. And finally, these are some of our uh, measures for the, the uh, post operative Just for resources for folks who are interested in this, guidelines on the ERAS Society has guidelines for life. Um, they have guidelines for contacts. Um, when, when I left, when I left, they were doing the recovery called marrow transplant. So, Everybody's getting on board. Everybody's trying to do this. specific ERAS guidelines. And, and, and I think what we need to do is do a The national model we have is a traditional recovery pathway. The enhanced recovery pathway have to turn on to get the patient onto the enhanced recovery pathway. I think my vision for this program and for what I think we should all try to do in our practice is for any of our elective operations, basically enhanced recovery should be the default. It's not enhanced recovery, it's just recovery. It's just what we do. And then if needed, the enhanced recovery protocol can be turned off and a quote, more traditional recovery pathway can be used. But again, I think, I think really um, the power of this really comes in when we sort of make it the standard for how we take care of these patients. And with that, I'll end leaving some time for some questions. I think you've got some comments on the uh, in, in the uh, chat session. Uh, Russ Farmer. Uh, All right, let me see what I can big point. Many, many centers and countries use expiral based on tap. We've been told time and again we get expiral. So, yeah, the, the, I think we can figure out that expiral is cost effective. In, in my heart, I believe it's cost effective. I think it is hard uh, to prove that. But I think when you look at it, when you compare a ta a expiral to the professional fees associated with epidurals, I think I I think you still come out winning, um, and it's so it's tough. And yeah, you talk about epidurals making people follow the pathway again. I I think the future of enhanced recovery is away from epidurals. Um, I think when they came about, it was a lot better than giving patients big slugs of of opioids on PCAs. Since we've gotten better with that, I think we can do better. And if we get better with our TAP and regional blocks, and if we can convince institutions to allow us to use Expiril, um, I think I think epidurals will fall away. Yes, I think we should be giving TAPs preoperatively. Uh, uh, we can do it, I don't know, in pre-op holding, I would say we could just do it, I, we could do it once they're asleep in the operating room, but before we make an incision, I think that, I think that makes sense. Uh, Dr. Echo Chuck's question. Oh, yep, yep. So that's what Dr. Shunt says. That blocks. Um, what is else? Some of the expert data tainted by industry. Probably. Um, Dr. Martin do this when we were trying to get this in Nortonville. Uh, um, you find the good data. So I think we need to. Uh, Maybe we need to develop it. So, we think epidurals may decrease or may increase it, or we might decrease it. Um, more about not using it. I think those are the questions that came, came across. The others. 
Very good, Michael. Very good. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. I think it's time for QI conference. Hopefully, 